maybe, um, by um, just telling you about the when you have to think about circuitry, you have to think about circuitry within the region, but also making sure that you know that this region will be connected to many others. So then in terms of circuitry, you have to think about like really local circuitry, but also like the, uh, you have to think about the input that is coming to that part of the brain. And if you look at the brain, um, you um, have sensory inputs that is coming from the skin, the muscles, the organs, and the pain um, pathways come in with uh, um, uh, via parallel uh, fibers. And the information or the sensory inputs will um, go up to the brain and mainly to the thalamus. And this thalamus will be connected to the somatosensory sensory cortex, and in turn, the somatosensory cortex will um, uh, send output to the thalamus. And this region is very important because uh, it is um, um, this region that receives um, as well visual inputs from the retina, and, uh, and the thalamus will just send the information to the visual cortex. So if you think about circuitry, the um, somatosensory cortex will receive uh, a very strong input from uh, the thalamus. And um, if we look at, first of all, the cortex, so in the cortex there, will, uh, there are uh, six layers. And um, the six layers will receive inputs from this thalamus. So this is... Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but you will have different nuclei, so the reticular thalamus, the uh, specific thalamus that will uh, send uh, in inputs to the, only to the uh, cortex and the non-specific thalamus that will just send fibers um, to other parts of the brain. And what we know is we can actually build the circuitry saying that the thalamus will send uh, mainly inputs to the um, different parts of the cortex or so different layers. And, um, and we can, we now have a, a pretty good idea of um, how this uh, connection occur. And, uh, and you can see as well that those connections will go to the other part of the cortex and will send um, 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 input to the striatum or the pons. So in terms of connectivity, if we want to add to, uh, to this circuitry, um, to add some intracortical excitatory connections, so only con pyramidal cells, two pyramidal cells, we can add some information. So, for example, we have a um, pyramidal cell in layer 4 that will send axon to layer 3. They can um, um, excite some pyramidal cell in the same layers, but that also will send axon to layer 5 and layer 6. That means that they can have uh, um, um, excitation, uh, excitation from layer 4 to layer 5 and layer 4 to layer 6 and so on. And we now have a pretty good idea how all the different types of pyramidal cell in each layers are connected. So I'm not going to give you like a list of all the connections, but um, this information exists. So for example, the layer three will be um, sending an axon to layer well, like two one. They also um, uh, send axon like within layer three, so we'll be able to contact layer three cells, and they also send axon to layer five and layer six. And we can do a pretty complex, or you can end up with a very complex um, circuitry of the cortex with different pyramidal cell in uh, the different layers of the cortex will be connected to each other and, uh, and connected to um, different cells in different layers. You have to think also that you will have activation or sensory inputs that the flow of inf information within the cortex will um, send 
motor outputs and input control. This uh, you will have circuitry within the cortex, but you will have also long-distance cortical-cortical connections. So the pyramidal cells are uh, connected to each other locally, but that also um, will have some connections with different parts of the cortex and different parts of the brain. So uh, it will make a, a pretty um, complicated map about like all the types of connection and, uh, and that will add another layer to uh, the complexity of your model if you want to, um, to add all this information. So um, is the connectivity within the cortical circuit is random or selective? Well, I talked to you yesterday. Yeah. I don't know if it works, this one. When you say random, what do you mean? Random is, uh, um, it means that if that particular connection, does it happen randomly? Do, you, do we know if, um, if a cell just send an axon and will contact like the first like cells next to it, like next to it, or does it just send axon and just like stop when you find its partner? Does it make sense? I guess that's a point uh, um, Renko pointed out yesterday. I think you are using random as a bad thing. It means we don't understand what is this. And this is not the meaning of random. Random means that you have some, uh, something which is unpredictable, even if you have a very clear structure. It could be selective and random. Yeah, it, it does. But what I mean by that is, is do we know why this um, particular cell is connected to this particular cell? Okay, random, so it uh, means something we don't know why. We don't understand. Yeah, so or... That's to do not with, uh, with the brain, but with the fact that we don't understand. Say, a connection would be uh, equally probable to, say, any direction. This would be random, probably, in this sense. Yes, yeah. But then she's saying that uh, uniform. uniform, yeah, uniformly random. Yeah, yeah, that's what probably mm. they mean when they say random. Isotropic or uniformly random, irrespective of the region. But now, I mean, what she's saying is that, that they say a particular neuron would send connections to neurons in that region not in the other regions. That's, that's what, what yeah. I mean, okay, so random is, might not be the, the right word, but is it selective? Can we say that when you look at one cell, you know that this cell is in particular layer? Do we know that it will contact a particular cell, or do we think that it could just be contacted to any other cell, like around, basically? And, um, and we know that this connectivity is very selective. So some cells will be connected to one particular cell, but um, this like first cell might, um, we know that is never connected to another type, for example. And this is what I'm gonna talk to you about. So for example, this uh, three cells, so you have a, a pyramidal cell in layer three and two cell in layer four. So if we do triple recording, so you put three electrodes in each of the cells, and you can have a pretty good idea on how they're connected to each other. So for example, the orange cell will be connected to this cell. So, um, so when the, you elicit an action potential in the first one, you will elicit uh, EPSP. But the same cell is connected to the layer three cells. And, and this particular cell will also be connected to the first one. So you end up with uh, a very good idea of the circuitry um, uh, of the different layers. Yeah? Do I understand correctly that if the cells are pretty close, mm -hmm. then you're almost sure that they will be connected? No. No? No. Okay, so there's no. some, I mean, what determines then whether they are connected or not? Well, that's what I mean. It's just uh, depending on the type of receptors and the type of cells, the different properties or the intrinsic property of the yeah. cells, you will know that that particular connection will be made. So, okay, yeah, no, no. I mean, this okay. is, okay, so this is um, 100 micron, like the, this is the scale here. So, there are a lot of cells around. 
-hmm. And you can be pretty sure that we have tried those cells. So when we do the experiments, literally you just put the, the electrode on uh -huh. one and you just go around just until you find your cell. Okay. And this is what I talked to you about yesterday about hit rates. So we know that for that particular cell, you will find one connection out of six, seven, or, or so on. So for each type of um, pyramidal cell in each layer, we are able to say, actually, this cell it will be connected with this other type of cells, and the hit rate will be one in seven. So that means that you so have... So hit rate would mean the proportion of pairs yes. for which... Yeah. Okay, we yeah. would call that a probability. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. We and then we would call it rate. random. So, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's just a matter of te uh, terminology. Yeah. No, so no, what you're saying is that that certain cells, depending on the type, will be connected to other cells of a certain type. Yes. And you know that very well. So yeah. that's very deterministic. Yeah. But then when you see the, the type of cells that might be connected to one another close by, mm -hmm. then actually sometimes they are connected and sometimes they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, if we think that there are several types of excitatory glutamatergic cells, and there are 20 types or more than 20 types of inhibitory cells in each layer, in each of the five layers of the cortex. This means that you will have more than 100 cell types in the cortex. And do we know how they're wired together? Is it, well, again, I've got randomly, but um, randomly or selectively. So if you look at this little cartoon, so these cells will send axon around, and we know that um, will send axon and will be connected to this one, but will also be connected to the interneuron next door. So if you add even more cells, you um, sometimes this axon will be sent to these cells, for example, but doesn't find the right partner or the, the right channels or the right receptors, and therefore we'll just retract and we'll just try, try somewhere else and, until it finds its partner. And, and we know that this is very selective um, because um, I'm not going to go very much into it, but we try cell cultures. So when you actually just use very, very simple um, uh, preparations where there is no extracellular matrix, so you, you know that um, if you put uh, uh, neurons in contact with some hex cells, which are hex cells, like cells which um, nothing on them, like nothing that will, um, uh, will be completely uh, um, uh, pure, uh, and you can manipulate those cells to put random receptors. And uh, if you put um, receptors, for example, for the GABAE receptors, there are different subtypes, and we can um, manipulate the cells so it express only one type of um, receptors, and we put them in core cultures, so you put them all together, and we can uh, follow the axon, and the axon will only form synapses onto the cells only if they find the right partner. So we can say that uh, the uh, connectivity um, is very specific. And yet random. And yet random. <laughs> I, I guess the reason, Henk, and I are insisting on this is because if we don't understand the words the other community uses, we can't work together. And I think one of the main points is that uh, random graphs uh, are not things I cannot uh, understand. It, it are mathematical objects in which you can have selectivity and randomness, exactly the way you are describing. So all your graphs, the one you are describing, are random. So you, you sh you should but to me, it's not random. Eh? To me, it's not random. But because, <laughs> because you not to use the word random in the way it is used in science. Well, no, but for me, it's, it's not random in the terms that if you replace one cell, you will have, you will, the connection will not be formed. And to me, it's not random. So you, you just, you have to have the right partners all around the, the, the circuits. And in that case... 
Well, it's not random. No, so no what, what, it doesn't what choose you call, it. What you call way. the hit rate, no. we would call, call a probability. So we would call it random. If, if two types, if a pair of two types of cell Yeah, but you know that the probability connected. will be always, because that particular cell will always be connected to that particular cell. So then the, pro the probability is like cell. different. But there, yeah. there are many of the same pairs of types yeah. close by, and some are connected and some are not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's selectivity in the different types, but there may be randomness in the right types. Um, I think it depends how you define types. If you, if for example, uh, if one calls a type, let's say a pyramidal cell who, pro who projects mainly to layer two, it is clear that it will only uh, connect to cells in layer two. So you can, in a way, say that it's very selective, yep. but the point is, does it, does it connect to the cells in layer two in a probabilistic manner, or does it in addition, are there in addition cells in layer two which have special receptors and uh, so that in, in yeah, so it depends yes. if the definition is based on <coughs> ramification patterns or on really chemical markers. Chemical, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And A question of probability. I mean, still uh, there is the possibility that this specific, this individual, will not be connected to the network we are looking at. This is what I understand as being uh, the concept of, of randomness in this case. You see. So, so something that is not random could be, for example, that you have these layer two cells that apparently are always connected or mostly connected to one another mm -hmm. and then you say that a particular layer 2 cell will be connected to the 10,000 layer 2 cells that are closest by. So that's a deterministic rule. You look at how many... But they will not. Precisely. <laughs> that's the point. So we would call that then random. It will connect to some but not to others and you could yeah, describe but that specific by... Specific connections will not be random to me. Okay, that's fine. It could be a, a difference in terminology. I, I don't know. Well, I think I think it is, but um, yeah, I think okay. it is. That is in yes, for, sure, for sure it is, but it will not help science if the two communities use the same word in a different manner. Okay. And I, I guess it's uh, hopeless to, to 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 change the the sense of randomness among mathematicians, because this has been defined long <laughs> so time ago. So we have to change it, yeah? <laughs> because uh, this is not a notion uh, in biology. <laughs> in biology, the notion of randomness appears that uh, something I don't understand. Uh, so uh, common it's a common sense word. It's not a scientific word. So, uh, uh, but this is the same for linguists, for people in other areas. So they understand the, um, randomness in a sense which is not a scientific sense. In mathematics, it's a measure. Okay. It's a measure. What you are describing, you are describing a measure. So this is, in strictly speaking, randomness. Of course, I cannot oblige you to change your vocabulary, but it would be good if you understand each other. So I would make a huge effort to, to understand what is the vocabulary of uh, neurobiologists. Mm -hmm. If you make the same effort, life will be much easier. <laughs> But, I mean, there's if a lot I of change it, it would be even better, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of confusion about this throughout the sciences. I mean, I also see that in networking that some people are saying, well, uh, uh, you talk about a random graph and then it's always an erdos venue random graph and you talk about a not random graph, which is something like a scale-free random graph and we would call, still call that a random graph. So there's a lot of confusion about terminology and it's very important to get the terminology straight. But I, I wouldn't be as dogmatic as you are to say that somebody from another field has to change his or her language. As long as I understand what the <laughs> language means. And for me, it means something else than, uh, I mean, randomness apparently in, in this context is something else than what I would associate to randomness. Well, that's fine, as long as I understand what it means. Well, yeah, I think, I think if you understand what yeah. I mean by, by selective and just that one cell would just go for that particular cell. So when it's just born, he knows exactly which partner he wants to be with, really, basically. I mean, yeah. there is some prior uh, 
uh, in finding her own partner. Yeah, but you, that connection will be made only if he finds the right partner. Yeah, but in the beginning, he will, the cell will connect to many possible partners, and then it, it selects the one which is more effective. But it doesn't the, connect to it. So you will have functional not, not functional synapse between the between the, the two if if they're not partners. Yeah, and this but is what I mean by it's just not around. random. It's just the cell will will be born and know exactly where it wants to go, and and will only form functional synapse with one particular cell. And to me, to me, this is just not random. But I think it's just, I think we, we have to agree to disagree with that. Well, it would not be only one. Well, no, 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 it's just like simple, but it's just... Um, Yes, yeah, so that, what, what I mean, it's just like with the right receptors, with the right, the right type, that, uh, and, um, and, uh, and that's what... Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Yes, sorry. So, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I don't know if, if I understood it right, but from what I get about it, it says that I think that uh, what you ought to understand is that for you, random would be completely random. While here, there is some randomness, there is some degree of randomness, but there, is still, there are still some underlying rules. Like, for example, certain types will connect to certain others, certain layers will, will connect to certain others, mm -hmm. but there is still some degree of randomness in the sense that for a, for a given type of cell, to which other particular cell from the same type this will be random. So it could connect to different individuals of this other type, but to which individuals it will connect, this you don't know. That yeah. is where you have the randomness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's not completely random, but it's random to some degree. It's not completely random, but random. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, completely random is that there's no rule. Any type can connect to any type, any layer to any layer. That's not the yeah, case. Yeah, so that's what I mean. There, there but are some for rules. Me it's just like random is just, like, yeah, you, have some, you just throw like different type of cells and they would just make connection with like the one exactly. next to it because you doesn't have to go and, and search somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah, I think, I think it's just terminology between the two. It's just like yeah. where we, yeah. It's an unfair coin, then it might end up heads with probability 0 0.8. That's not uniformly at random, but it's still random because you still don't know which answer you're going to get if you throw three or four times. Mm -hmm. right? So anything where you don't really know what is going to happen, probably is considered to be random and they, they, that, that's, a, that's a paradigm to modeling. Mm -hmm. So even when there are underlying rules, still, if you don't know what is happening precisely, you could call it could call it random. But of course, in your model, you have to take the rules into account. Otherwise, your model is going to be very bad. Yeah. That's clear. Yeah. Yeah. Statistical. I mean, I mean st statistical, statistical is, 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 is randomness is, with some rules. No, 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 that's probabilistic. I mean, it's statistical, oh, yeah, I think. Uh, probabilistic, yeah, okay. I, I mean, the <laughs> difference between probability and statistics is that in statistics, you have data and you try to, to say something about the model, whereas mm -hmm. in probability theory, you have a model and you try to say something about the model. Mm -hmm. So as, as, as soon as you start comparing with data, it becomes statistics. If you don't compare to data, it's probability. Yeah. But it's sort of two sides of the same coin. So. Okay, let's move on then. <laughs> so um, we know that um, uh, connections, we have a pretty good idea of the connection within, like with inhibitory neurons. So for example, this particular neuron here in red will be connected to one uh, um, pyramidal cell in, in layer two, but will also receive like um, a connection from uh, cells in layer three. And this particular neuron also will uh, receive a connection from another type of um, inside neurons. So it's my little diagram from yesterday where 
one cell is connected to the other, but each cell will receive other connection from different cells, and you will have um, um, in the mix uh, pyramidal cell and inhibitory neurons. So if we look, for example, at the type of connection, so you will have this one connected to this one, and, and so on. So you can build or to have a very clear idea how the particular cell will be connected to different cells around it. So what is the meaning of the layers precisely? The meaning of the layers is yep. what I show you the first slides, is different layers will receive inputs from different parts of the brain. But how you define the layers? Uh -huh. so you go from one layer to another layer? Well, then, then it's the anatomy. It's just we, we know that some layers are, are much, have much larger cells, like layer 5. You will have a combination of large cell and small cells. And, uh, and, and then it's a question of uh, neuroanatomy. So, and and well, there is, there are, because like different type of cells will have different like firing properties or, or synaptic um, intrinsic properties of the different layers. But each layers, like layer four or six, will receive inputs from the thalamus, and uh, and for example, layer two or five will receive more like cortical cortical uh, connections. So in terms of circuitry, is very important. Those layers are very important. Is there, there is a strict boundary between layers. It, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at it, you, it's quite clear. I mean, depending on the, obviously, all the histology protocol that Almut talked to us about. But it is, it is very clear, yeah. Uh, could you just go through a little bit the, the functional uh, results, I mean, the functional description of the, the relationship between the neurons? So, That's Just for the audience, it's so beautiful. <laughs> So, okay, so for example, this cell here was connected to the uh, interneurons. So when you elicit um, action potential in, in the pyramidal cell, you are able to, um, to record um, EPSP for, like for, uh, in this particular interneurons. So here was another type of, of cell. So you can see that this EPSP are different from this one. So in terms of functionality, or functionality is very important. So as I said yesterday, some will be um, um, uh, facilitating, some will be uh, uh, depressing. So this is very important in terms of circuits. And, um, and again, this interneuron at the same time is connected or will, uh, will contact different type of um, pyramidal cells. So you start to have a very good idea of one particular cell, so which connection are associated with that particular cell. And for, for this one, for the interneuron, interneuron, you can see that the connection is reciprocal. That means that this um, interneuron in red will be connected to the interneuron in white, but also the interneuron in white is connected to the interneuron in red. And if I want to make it, the, the circuitry I, I drew on the, on the board yesterday is I was talking to you about this cell is connected to this cell, but actually this second cell could be also connected to the first one. So some connection will be reciprocal, some will not. So we know we start to have a good idea of who's talking to who and, and, and so on and if the, the connection is reciprocal because um, if this interneuron contact or just uh, um, elicit, uh, if you have action potential in this uh, interneuron, will be, you will have a response in this interneuron. But if this particular interneuron also receive input from somewhere else, you might be able to elicit an action potential in this interneuron and in turn will inhibit the first one. Yeah? And, and all the connections are also, also have a multiplicity, right? I mean... What do you mean, multiplicity? If two cells are connected, they might actually be connected by three different synapses, yes. or four, or five, or six. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's what so I say. Much I more in terms yeah, of so topology. that's what I, I talked to you yesterday. Yeah. So right. at one, like one connection could have like, like four synapses, and, and, yeah. but those four synapses might not release neurotransmitter and so on. So right. then, yeah. then the synaptic plasticity just occurs there. Yeah. I'm sorry if, it's, if, it's, if this is a too naive question, but uh, do you have any neuron 
that has, uh, I mean, uh, excitatory synapses and inhibitory synapses? Uh, because, uh, I mean, you always saying like inhibitory neuron, excitatory neuron, but I, I think I've heard that you, the, you ha the B inhibitory or B excitatory is a characteristic of the synapse. Can mm -hmm. you have a neuron which makes inhibitory? Well, the same neuron can be uh, co can be connected to uh, a different type. So it could be either connected to pyramidal cells or could be connected to uh, uh, inhibitory cells. But yeah. that's what you yeah, talked yeah, to. Yeah, but is, this, this is what you talked to about yesterday. Yeah, then my, my question is not if um, excitatory neuron can be connected to other excitatory neuron and to other inhibitory neuron, but if one neuron... But yeah, but that means that's in one cell, you will have excitatory and inhibitory... Synapses. Yeah. But on the post-synaptic post side, so the cell can receive both yeah. either excitatory and inhibitory synapses, but the cell itself can only make one type. So cell one, cell. the cell with its yeah. axon is... All the cells on an axon are of the same type, excitatory or inhibitory. So, well, in some parts of the nervous system, it it can be like that. That, that it is determined by the receptor, but I think in the cortex it is uh, not so mixed. So in the cortex usually... Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, in, in some neurons, so inhibitory neuron will release GABA. So GABA will, will bind to GABA receptors and then just will be uh, responsible for inhibition. And, and uh, pyramidal cell will release glutamate and then will bind to NMDA receptors and then will uh, we'll have uh, an excitatory effect. Okay, so now we have a pretty clear idea of who's talking to who in each layers, and, uh, and this uh, really complex circuitry involves pyramidal cells and interneurons. So I'm not go going to go through like in each layers, but you can see we have an um, idea that where those particular cells sign up, and, uh, and usually it's mainly um, those. Um, uh, sorry. You will have a connection within layers, but you will have connection also uh, between layers for most of those cells. And the same is true for the neocortical interneurons. So I talked to you about uh, there are different types of interneurons, and we can um, uh, classify them depending on the type of calcium binding protein that they have or, uh, or peptides. So, for example, parvalbumin immunopositive uh, interneurons. So we have a clear idea where um, what they target and, and um, who they are talking to within the layers and between layers in the cortex. And it's the same for um, somatostatin immunopositive uh, interneuron or VIP immunopositive interneuron. So we, we can have a clear idea or clear map of uh, where those axons go and, and uh, who they are um, um, connected to. So, but again, those connections, uh, there's some connection that uh, we know that always happen, but some connection don't. So, for example, this um, layer 3 pyramid innervates layer 4 interneuron, but we know that layer 3 pyramid never um, contacts layer 4 spiny cells. So those um, connections, some connection will happen and some connection um, will not. So we're not, we know, we know that, we know that um, those type of cells we're never going to be connected to what each other. What are spiny cells? Spiny cells. What spiny is cells spine? is uh, very, very small cells in, uh, in layer 4. So it's another type of excitatory um, cells in the cortex. And they are inhibitory, excitatory? They are inhibitory. Inhibitory. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you, you know pretty much 
the type of connection within layer. So layer two, you know that you have um, intra or local um, connection between the pyramids. We know that the pyramids are connected to different layers. So for example, layer three, where layer four pyramid will contact layer two, three, and again, the layer three cells are connected to layer five, and then the information goes out to the other part of the brain. But we don't know or we're not sure about does layer 5 contact layer 3 or those layer 3 contact um, uh, layer 4. So um, those type of connections have never been um, uh, characterized. Does it really, is it because it's very rare so we can't actually uh, um, know about it or we don't know about it, we don't have enough data about it and, uh, and it is uh, very important to have a better characterization of those uh, connections. But I mean, scientists have been trying for many years so, so we're pretty sure that if it hasn't been found, maybe it just is not there. So, as I said yesterday, just go quickly that different connections will have different synaptic, synaptic uh, plasticity. So, for example, fast uh, parvovimin interneuron receive, um, receive uh, a depressing EPSP, where the second EPSP will be shorter than the, uh, the first. But on the other type, other type of interneuron for the, like the adapting or LTS Martinetti cells in the, in the cortex receives slower and facilitating EPSP. So, um, this is just a repeat of yesterday. So some connections will be depressing, some connection will be, uh, facilitating depending on the intrinsic property of the uh, interneuron involved. Um, the same is true for uh, uh, pyramidal cells in the cortex. So you, in layer six, you will have two types of uh, pyramidal cells. You have the cortico-cortical pyramids and the cortico-thalamic um, uh, pyramidal cells. So cortico-cortical, we know that those connections only are in layer six. So they are connected to each other. And those particular type of cells um, receive a depressing EPSP, so again, so this is two types of connection, so you elicit action potential on, in one and you just record the EPSP in the other. And uh, to date, um, the cortical, um, uh, um, cortical, cortical um, generate depressing EPSP in all postsynaptic targets studied and they rarely innervate interneuron. And uh, on the other hand, um, a corticothalamic uh, layer 6 pyramid will display, display much less adaptation and generate a facilitating EPSP. So all that just to say that we, uh, we know um, a, a lot more about the connections and, uh, and uh, seems to have a, a very um, selective um, connection between, uh, between the neurons. Um, this is um, to show you that for each type of connection, we are able to see or to have putative contacts between the neurons. So we are able to, um, to draw the axon and find or try to, uh, to look at where the axon is in a very close contact with the dendrites. So we can say that it's, it might be a putative contact. So um, in that case, um, they are like in a circle. But we know that the synapse is contributing to our connections. And again, random, sorry, are not random randomly distributed, so um, despite contribution from uh, several axonal and dendritic branches. So they appear to select the similar class <coughs> sorry, of dendrites and electrotonic distance from the soma. So if we look here, so this cell, and you, you can see the axon in, in uh, blue here, and some putative contact. And we know that's what we call the shell hypothesis, and usually the contacts are always at equidistance of the soma. <coughs> Sorry. 
uh, I couldn't um, go into into too much detail, but just looking at the at the, the morphology, those signups will be really just uh, closer to um, will be closer to the to the soma, and uh, and they're always at the same at the same uh, position uh, within within the soma. And okay. as in general, when you have, when, uh, uh, can you say that the given given function? actually creates a structure of connection, one structure of connection, one pattern of connection. So if you do something, I don't know, vision or whatever, it usually creates some kind of a pattern of connection. Can you relate this to things? I don't know what you mean. Sorry. So, so when your brain is under, do, does some function, let's say, I see you now, mm -hmm. okay? So when I see you tomorrow, will I have the same pattern of connection in the brain? Probably. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because depending on what you're doing, like, no. I mean, this is just, uh, the, this one is memory. It just, I, I mean, it's just... It's not true. Yeah, we I mean, know the experiment Sedata told me a long time ago, you have a monkey doing the same thing, you have electrodes in the cortex, and what you see changes. But, but, does, it, but does it change that different neutrons are working, or but the structure of the connection, a click, whatever, you know what I mean? Well, at least uh, you don't see the same neurons. That's so for sure. You don't see. It, 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 it's an intrinsic vari variability that you have. So otherwise, it would be simple when they do EEG, you have a huge amount of neurons working together. And to see, uh, evoke the potential, they are obliged to repeat it in, with the same timing and make averages. Otherwise, you have, a, well, we could call it noise or whatever, but maybe are not exactly the same neurons. So you, you have something which is r intrinsically uh, random. Do you want to say something? Yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm not at all an expert, but uh, perhaps it's also a problem of scaling. An example, uh, the um, Jack Gallant work on MRI that you can decode, so to say, activity and uh, um, see a kind of a film from the visual cortex. This is only possible because you have some, um, how you say, you can predict some patterns of activity, but they will be not exactly the same, for sure not. And it will depend on the scale. This is... Uh, Exactly. This paper, this, this work where, where they can, so to say, decode the function MRI and reconstruct the... So did, he, did he find out some structure in this MRI? Yes. Okay. Of course. If not, it would be never possible to decode the disease. Exactly. Exactly. And this is a scale problem. If you go now to the single cell activity, the patterning will be not exactly the same and then comes back to the problem of um, probability. But she's talking about microscopic scale. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> Okay, so that was um, for the cortex. So just uh, just to finish uh, this talk, I just want to talk to you about what happened in the hippocampus. So um, so we know that the uh, inputs of the hippocampus is um, uh, coming from the antoinal cortex, and really the flow of information in the hippocampus will relate to the connection between pyramidal cells, and the, this activity is modulated by the neurons inside the uh, different layers. So the flow of information is the information is coming from the uh, layer two of the antoinal cortex that will contact what we call the Dante gyrus. And this is a trisynaptic um, a loop that is, uh, has been described uh, before. So the Dante gyrus is then uh, contact, um, uh, contact the um, the CS3 region of the hippocampus. CS3 is then um, connected to CA1, and the information just leaves the hippocampus to go back to the entorenal cortex from like CA1 to the entorenal cortex. But at the top of that, we also know that the entorenal cortex is able to contact CA2 as well 
as contacting CS3. We know that the internal cortex can contact the Dante gyrus, and the Dante gyrus is then con uh, connected to CA2, and CA2 region will be then connected to CA1, and we know that the um, uh, CA1 and CA2 will also receive input from the amygdala. So when you think about circuitry, you need to uh, think about the inputs that that particular um, um, regions um, receive. And uh, you have to, uh, to really think about that in each of those regions, you will have local circuitry that would involve pyramidal cells and interneurons. Some of the cells, for example, in CA2, will contact CA1 and CA3 and therefore are thought to be modulating like the entire ne network, basically. So you need to know the location of the cells and the intrinsic property of the cells are very important in terms of um, circuitry. Of the hippocampus. So, um, so this is the same slide that yesterday. So you will have uh, interneurons that have like a unique anatomy. You have specific firing properties and specific synaptic properties for each type of uh, uh, connections that are, um, are out there. So some interneurons will be specific to a particular region. So for example, this cell here in, um, that are described in CA2 have never been uh, described before. So some um, connections or some interneurons are just very specific in terms of location in the circuitry. And, um, and we think really because um, this particular cell have axon in only one layer. So Again, the hippocampus have different layers, and, uh, and again, the layers, different layers will receive input from different parts of the brain. And, uh, and this particular type, because it has axon in one particular layer, will really be able to modulate only the, um, the input that will coming from the, well, for in that case, from the antorinal cortex in CA2. So, each interneuron will have a specific pattern in terms of um, axon or, uh, axonic pattern, and that will uh, have an influence uh, on the circuitry. So if we go back to, um, to the questions that I showed you yesterday, so we need to build a clear map of the diversity and specificity of the cortical circuits. So we need to know who is connected to whom, and now we start to have a very good idea of who is connected to whom um, in the cortex and the hippocampus. And um, the cell type, there is a need for better classification and characterization of the cell types. So again, there is more than 20 types. Can you actually just put some of them together so, so you know that, for example, do you want to put all the depressing inputs or, or all the facilitating inputs together if um, that makes sense and if you think that it will just simplify the model that you want to, to do. Um, inhibition, are there more classes of interneurons? So at the moment, on, like more than 20 exist, but are there, are there more interneurons? I know that in CA2, I just uh, um, characterize only three, four types now, and, uh, but are there more? Are there more like specific to that particular regions? And what, why are they there for? And um, some connections are not very well characterized. So does it mean that if we haven't seen one connection between the neurons, do, shall we say that it doesn't exist? Or is that because it's very rare? And if it's really rare, is that any like relevant to any of the circuitry around? And, um, and uh, Synaptic dynamics, are they selectively expressed? So, well, I'll show you that there are, and, um, and some connections would be very specific and, uh, and very um, selective. Thank you.
You've uh, discussed the, uh, the inhibitory cells to great detail. There are 20 of them. They come in different layers and so on. How about the excitatory ones? Is, is the majority just pyramidal? And is only the layer important, or how should I look at that? Well, they are. They are. They are. I mean, in the cortex, in the hippocampus, we we think there may, there may be like two or three types, but um, they not. The differences between the two, between the two or three um, mainly um, anatomical. So, I mean, some some uh, pyramidal cell will have different type of like. For example, firing pattern. So, in the, in the case, if you change the firing pattern, the type of the connection will change as well. So, um, some will be uh, will be bursting. So, what we mean bursting is is the inter interval, in, like oh, interspike interval, is very very short. So, in terms of of um, uh, synaptic properties, that would change. And um, in the cortex, for example, in layer six, you will have cortical cortical um, uh, pyramids or cortical thalamics. And again, those two types of cells will receive like different type of connections and um, and in the cortex you might think that there might be 10 types of, of pyramidal cell within each layers and then 20 types of internal within like in each layers as well so um, taken all together you will have more than 100 cell types yeah. in the cortex more than 100 well if you have different type of pyramidal cell, different type of interneurons in each of the five layers or the six layers, you will yeah. end up with a lot so of diversity. It, uh, the majority of the, the cells is excitatory, mm -hmm. and there are fewer types of excitatory cells than there are inhibitory cells. Yeah. Um, so you, you've described what is known about it, but is there, is there any knowledge as to why this is the case? Why are there so many in, in, uh, types of inhibitory cells? Well, some, I mean, in terms of uh, a function, so mm -hmm. uh, if you think about synaptic uh, plasticity or um, um, some cells that are uh, facilitating will be much, much more involved in high frequency because uh, because then they they can just sustain like a, a very high frequency because, meaning that the uh, the summation of the EPSP will just, will make it so they might fire a bit more so then then those those cells will be able to to be uh, to sustain the very high frequency compared to the other i mean you have to think about the different states or theta states so if you are asleep if you are if you're doing something you will have different type of connection in so, okay. so I, I, I think it's you have to have different type of connection that will be um, excited differently okay. depending on the on okay. the different things. Uh, but when you say types in, in in inhibitory cells, isn't it also so that it is one definition of type is that one cell type ramifies mainly in this layer and another one mainly in this layer, mm -hmm. in another layer or so. So uh, in that case, the difference in f function would simply be inhibition in layer three, while other types may I make inhibition in layer five. Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't that also one? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's more a spatial, a spatial difference than maybe a, a functional or so. Well, it's but both. in addition, you may some it's have who have also functional difference, but, yeah. but I think in I think you have uh, to take it all in, like because those interneurons will have different the the um, their uh, morphology will be different, so mm -hmm. they will send axon like in different layers, but mm -hmm. the intrinsic property of the uh, that specific type will have an influence into the function mm -hmm. of that particular cell. So, so sometimes you have, you have cells which inhibit mainly along uh, in different layers like this, and others will ma more yes. inhibit yeah. in this direction. Yeah. Uh, so they will. Uh, um, you would think that because that particular layer will receive input from uh, a particular or specific uh, part of uh, for the, the brain, or they just uh, they will be recruited differently. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Uh, thank you for very, very beautiful results and the, the work you have presented. Thank you. And it's amazing uh, in the level of detail what it's been possible to, to observe and investigate. I was thinking in terms of redundancy, a little bit in the direction that 
has been put here. I mean, do you think that you could um, uh, classify in more general terms, or uh, is there, in your point of view, any redundancy, any functional redundancy in this different? Uh, if you consider, for instance, the pairs of uh, neurons and or the, the functional descriptions that you have brought us, and as and in an analogy, if you could consider each of uh, these uh, specific pairs are letters of an alphabet, so that you could. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a scientist. I would think that if it's there, it's there for reasons, and um, and I don't think it's uh, it's um, I don't think any of those connections are redundant. I mean, they they're there, and uh, and if they're there, they just really important for uh, a specific questions. Redundancy. Okay. Right. Okay. Reason, yeah. You need lots of, of processors just to have redundancy, and this has some function. Mm. So this is the reason for redundancy, at least in computational theory. But, yeah. but maybe in biology, maybe different. Okay, it's terminology again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you for the for the very nice talk. I have two two questions. One, uh, the. This, you describe the process where the cell is searching for a connection mm -hmm. and when the axon is, is like going through the layers and, and finding a, a, on another cell to connect. Does that happen only in the, devel in the development or also uh, in during adult uh, function? And the other one... The, all the, the, um, the results I showed you uh, are adult. Result. Okay, good. We we only use on uh, use adults. It's just because, um, um, as I showed yesterday, that the the uh, properties of the connections are different in juvenile um, animals. So everything is much lower. So we're just using um, adult animals just uh, just to make sure that we well, want to be consistent and just to be able to to see what is going on the closest so of what is going on to um, human brain, which is, I mean, those ones are rats. Well, actually, some of them, some of them are cats as well. So we had some cat data as well. So. And, and are they, I mean, are, are, do more connections are created and more axons are sent to a specific region if, like, in, for the animal experience or human experience, uh, uh, it seems that that connection is important. I mean, do they send more axons if if to do it? If they think that it, it's important. Um, yeah, if they are. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? You you might have more connections for one particular type if if we think that that particular type has a very uh, highly important function. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For example, in, during learning, I mean, if I. I mean, already now that, and I'm, I recently begi begin to learn how to to walk, uh, to bike. Yeah, mm -hmm. to, so, and then, uh, does does this experience make uh, more accents to to go and connect for this reason, or it, it's just drived by another another Probably, factor? Probably, but then you have all the inputs from like all the input that coming from everywhere in the brain. So. I, just, but I, I think so. Yeah, I, I just well, want I really to, so. to, to know if it's uh, an important thing for, le for learning or, or learning would be more uh, driven by LTP and other... Well, other I, stuff. Think, I think learning is, yeah, yeah probably uh, driving more LTP and just like memory, like flow um, within the hippocampus, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other question is uh, you... you like small okay. Small contribution, Hello, uh, is, uh, you have here fixed connectivity, but it doesn't mean that everything is made up on fixed connectivity. You have the whole dynamics that change. Example, attention. You can have interactions happening in this fixed um, connectivity, and the learning and all this process will be made upon this fixed connectivity, but dynamically change depending on experience, uh, depending on learning, depending on memory, and many other things. So this um, is a different um, answer to your question. And the other one is you... you yeah, actually, there is something... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, since we are talking about that now. 
and I'm actually not an expert on that, but I've read that um, especially in juvenile ages that it's very plastic and that actually experience really drives a lot what connectivity will develop in the I heard about the cortex, about the hippocampus. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So, for example, like which uh, retinal cells will uh, connect to what thalamic cells yeah. and what thalamic cells to what cortical cells. <coughs> this is very experience-driven mm. during early yeah. stages of life. Yeah. There are these famous experiments by Huvel and Wiesel, I think, on, on ocular dominance and these things. So I think this is not so much related to learning, but more on development of selectivity. To orientation selectivity and these things. Okay. Yes, I think we are on time. Well, let's thank on to you for this. <laughs> lecture by Olmot Schultz and uh So I will continue my talk from yesterday. So we still have the same title, uh, the same title, but uh, part two, network structure and functional conclusions. Um, in the beginning, I will continue uh, where I stopped yesterday, namely say something about the density of synapses along axons and probability of connections between neurons, which... Uh, um, continues the topic of Audrey. <laughs> uh, but before, um, before I want briefly to thank you, Antonio, for your question yesterday concerning the 8.6 times 10 to the 10th neurons in the brain, according to Herr Gulano Hausel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just to, to tell you that I trust her a lot. Uh, but? No, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I even reviewed some of her papers. So, um, but yeah, but that I for <laughs> <laughs> forgot yesterday to mention the, the very different kind of methods used where you do not need any stereology. She takes the brain and makes some kind of soup out of yes, it. Just as you're, you're asking. Yes, something like that, the and, and uh, then take small volumes and count all the neurons and extrapolate on the whole volume. And uh, then she came up with something, what, what did you say, 8.6 times 10 to the 10th? No, 8.6 8, 6, 8, 6 to the ah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. which is quite similar to, to the sen, 7 times 10 to the 10th, which I tend to use from Hauk. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. And uh, also, I want to but show. What I understood is that you you say that it's not a big, 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 big deal to differ from the first figure. So no yeah. reason to discuss about it. That's it. You don't make. You a, said it. You don't make a big mistake if you <laughs> round up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also wanted to briefly show this picture. Um, it's because sometimes yesterday came also up the term, the question of cell density, cell number, big and large brains. Briefly, I think this topic will come up probably again. Uh, I just want to show this interesting graph here where you have brain weight against total number of neurons. And there are data again from Herculano Hausel and also from Breitenberg showing uh, that this is here um, a quite regular relationship between brain weight and total number of neurons, and the human, interestingly, has less neurons than he should have, according to this, um, which means that 
uh, yeah, a lower density of neurons may be a good sign. <laughs> it means that you have a lot of connectivity. Uh, yes. Uh, you're, sorry, sorry, you're right. Sorry, forget, forget what I said. <laughs> forget what I said. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Completely wrong. So, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, completely wrong. Yeah, okay. I hope, yeah. Okay, let's fast continue. <laughs> yeah, the wish was the, yeah. Okay, now... Um, Density of synapses along axons. Um, in, in, in reality, synapses you see only in the electron microscope, but uh, uh, God was kind enough to make also some <laughs> indications uh, how to see, detect synapses in the light microscope by producing these uh, synaptic, these bit boutons. Uh, on axons. So uh, once we investigate it, if this, is, if this is true, if there's really always a synapse and only synapse where you have these boutons. So, um, so this is a Golgi state, uh, which you see in the light microscope, and there are possibilities to see this also in the electron microscope. You have to take out again the stain um, because otherwise the whole structure would just fall out. So you, there are only little dots left. So this is a piece of axon with a uh, with a, such a bouton, and here you see the synapse. And uh, we could show that indeed uh, the synapses on the axon are located on these uh, boutons. Sometimes there are two of them on one bouton, but you really, uh, but the boutons are really a good indication of the location of synapses. Um, here, this is, uh, shows many of them. Uh, here you see always collaterals. You, you see only the boutons, and this gives you an impression how the boutons are um, distributed on axons. Along axons, I say this because People who do not know much about the brain, they may think a neuron makes a synapse, uh, an axon goes somewhere, makes an end ramification, and makes synapses there. But in the cortex, um, the synapses are made all along the collaterals um, in, where the, in places where the, the axons are not myelinated. In average, we came up with one synapse every five micron on axon collaterals. Uh, here you see an autocorrelation between this, uh, between, uh, so this tells you some, shows you if there are some preferred intervals, and there are not. There is no peak apart from the one at zero. Uh, so though no, there seems to be no trend because one could think maybe a neuron makes, goes to a neuron, makes many, a number of neurons goes to the next, makes again, let's say many and so on. Uh, from that distribution, we did not have this impression. So um, now what our uh, co-worker Bernhard Helwig did was to uh, go a bit more into the question of probability of connections between neurons um, in a very different way as you did. <laughs> uh, what he did was to inject neurons in, uh, intracellularly in slices of the red cortex, and then he drew... Um, Uh, the dendritic trees here, these are neurons located in layer 2 and here in layer 3. And the axonal trees of these neurons, uh, and you see, yeah, again, these are 
neurons from layer two and these from layer three, and you see the the, the uh, ramifications can be very clustered. And so what he did was a kind of computer experiment. He drew these uh, trees and three-dimensionally in a system which keeps the three-dimensional structures, and then he moved them across each other <laughs> uh, and uh, registered also whenever they're just from the ramification pattern, there was a chance to make a synapse. This does not mean that there was a synapse, but but uh, to make a synapse, the neurons must be quite close. So he registered always when they came in, in the same pixel of one micrometer diameter. And this is the result um, here. I, I think it's clear what he did. Uh, yeah. Uh, so he had so he took so he had eight eight pairs of uh, eight dendritic trees, eight axonal trees and he could create uh, by the 64 pairs of neurons which he moved where they moved the, den the axonal tree um, over the dendritic tree of a neuron at, at the, yeah, and just looked how, my, how often it happens that uh, the axonal tree and the dendritic tree fit, come into the same weeks, one piece of the uh, dendritic spine or whatever. Is in, in, in a computer experiment. Yeah, so these are real neurons, and uh, he kept the real location of the neurons. Uh, so each of them has a dendritic tree, which he drew separately, and then he moved. Uh, yeah, he moved uh, the axonal tree above the dendritic tree of this one, and of this one, and of this one. I mean. Um, all possible shapes which can happen, which can be there in layer two and layer three. Uh, <laughs> I, is that clear? Uh, <laughs> so it's a... Uh, the question is... So the result is if, if, if the cell bodies of the two neurons are located very... Here, here, this this is a connection probability, not the connection, but the connection probability. <laughs> um, uh, at depending on the distance between the cell bodies of the neuron in layer of a neuron in la of two neurons in layer two, and here of of an ac of a neuron from layer two onto a dendritic tree in layer three and here from a neuron in layer three onto the dendritic tree in layer two, and here from a neuron in layer three to a neuron dendritic tree in layer three. Excuse me, if there are different layers, does it mean that they are in the boundary in order to have a small distance? They are in the um, border. The, no, well, the, the cell body is located in layer two or in layer three, but, but the ramifications go over both layers. In the horizontal shift, the, the distance between the cell bodies, uh, the presynaptic cell body and the postsynaptic cell body, the cell body, yeah. Uh, no, no, that not, not necessarily on the same level. Uh, horizontal distance. You may have a horizontal distance, sorry. Yeah, on the... Co uh, uh, 
Yeah. So you have a no. Uh, so you, you may have well, you may have here a, a neuron sitting in layer two, and another one sitting in layer three. But the the one in layer three also makes uh, ramifications into layer two. And when I say distance, I mean this distance here in the horizontal plane. So this means that when uh, they are close together, uh, I mean, <laughs> or above each other, they have more or less full overlap between the axonal and the dendritic tree. And then you have a high probability of a connection, something like 80%. Um, Less so here in this case because the axon of layer 3 does not uh, be so much in overlap with the dendrite in layer 2. Uh, but in any case, you have a high probability when you are very close and this decreases with distance. Uh, yeah, with the, they, the three di in the computer you have the three-dimensional structure of the neuron, and in in the computer you make you so you pixel-wise pixel-wise you shift them against each other. Yeah. Now he also looked how often it happens. What is the probability that the axonal and the dendritic tree happen once or twice or three, four, five, six times, again for the four different cases. And this is what, we are, what you see, that there is a high probability of having one synapse only, then two synapses with, with, the, same dend with the same dendritic tree, two, th uh, three, four, five, six. Uh, this does not mean that he did not also see sometimes, um, uh, he, he stopped here, but it happened uh, in, in one case he find, found 18 synapses, in another case 14 and 15. So such high, uh, high um, meets could happen, but it was very rare. Uh, excuse me, Almut. Uh, this corresponds to the binomial in yesterday, Audrey uh, presented the binomial model for the number of um, what's the name? Um, yeah, how many contacts? How many contacts? So I would like to ask the statistician here, um, the chairman, of the statistician, if it, this looks like a binomial. Ah, that's right. P. Uh, clear? Or, yeah. Okay. So in average, this, these are the averages. Average number of contacts at a close location is something between two and three. And uh, or three, and then uh, it decreases with distance. Now, um, I don't consider this as a contradiction to what you said, because this depends, of course, very much what what neurons you are, you look at. If you have a, I mean, these were neurons in in the red in layer two and three. I think some of the examples you showed with. Uh, 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 there were very, they were very close together, of course, and I think they had very extensive axonal trees. Of course, this, this depends a lot on the density of axonal trees. Um, so you can have, um, I mean, for this is uh, this is what we see in in red 
pyramidal cells in layer 2, 3? Um, yes. Uh, sorry, the the dots are the the yeah. averages for for um, these sixty. I think I would assume that it's 128 dots. I <laughs> it is. I think it's 128 dots. What you see there. Okay. Uh, it it it's the average uh, for moving uh, average when moving so uh, when moving this in one direction and uh, average for moving this in the other direction. Um, so it's like a sliding window. Uh, uh, it is an average for each pair, for each pair one dot mm -hmm. and because uh, when you push each pair in both directions, so you want once go, now let's take this one, you pu put this in this in this direction and in this direction, you have two dots for each pair. Okay. So yeah, yeah. so it's averages. Now, what you can also uh, sorry, can sorry. I sorry. Yeah. follow up a little bit on this question? So yeah. we have these trees, which are three-dimensional objects, but your uh, but this graph is only showing one dimension. So it's is, true. It, it's yeah. independent of directionality. These are circularly symmetric well, uh, trees, um, or uh, we there was used, a direction which was. We used only this this plane, not the one. In this direction, because uh, because here we had f fully contained the, uh, I mean the, the the slice was 500 micrometer thick. Oh, it's and, because of uh, the slice that you have one direction which is given. Yeah. Ah, I see. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. So from this, uh, what you can also calculate. The total number of contacts a neuron gets from, from what distance does a neuron get most of its contacts? Thinking only about local contacts. We don't think about cortical cortical projections then. But um, as we said, we have a high probability. There's a high probability for close neighbors to be connected, but you do not have many close neighbors. You have the more, uh, with a larger distance, you have more neighbors, and, and this means that, for example, in this case, most of the inputs came from about 200 micron away, or, yeah, something like this. Okay, so, yeah. Now, yeah, now me, I said already some numbers, but I want now to talk, um, come a bit more to results and conclusions on all that. Um, first of all, I want to come with this number here. Uh, we did not talk about this before. The number of input neurons in case of the mouse cortex is something like below 10 to the sixth. What comes in from the thalamus, yes. Input uh, fibers which come into the cortex from another part of the brain, which is in most cases the thalamus. And this number is much lower than the, the number of neurons in the cortex. Uh, in, in the mouse, we have about 1.6 times 10 to the 7th neurons. Um, this is even more so in the human brain human cortex, the input neurons are of the order of 10 to the 8th and the neurons in the cortex of the order of 10 to the 10th. So um, two orders of magnitude more, which means, uh, and all these neurons make connections in the cortex also. Some of them also project out of the cortex, but all of them or nearly all of them will make connections in the cortex. So the conclusion from that is that the cortex is mainly connected in itself and the input is just like a, yeah, a drop so on a hot stone. So the, the input neurons, <laughs> where do they connect to? To the sensory Yes, to the, neurons, well, to, to the primary sensory cortices. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But you have, uh, I mean, input when you say what can, directly comes from the eye to the cortex goes through the the thalamus, but you get also mm -hmm. input to the cortex from from the rest of the thalamus. Um, uh -huh. And also from other brain regions? So all parts of the cortex get input from the thalamus, but it's quantitatively not very much. Okay. Yeah. This goes very well with um, what Francisco Varela and Roberto Maturana told me many, many years ago of the closure of the system. Sometimes we, uh, sensory physiologists, um, forget this that at mm -hmm. the end the inputs perturbate a closed system and I think that yeah. is very nice. So the brain as we do is thinking a lot but largely independent of what comes in and goes out. <laughs> but there's also m the more <laughs> output uh, projections from the cortex to the thalamus than from the thalamus to the cortex. Is it right? Also, yeah. also back, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah just, just if you to be more precise, what we took was the number of neurons in the thalamus is about 10 to the 8th, and under the assumption that all neurons from the thalamus project to the cortex, which is an exaggeration. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I would may I say something. It's just a metaphor. But um, if you take something like uh, the easy mode, what is the easy mode? Is the lattice, say, in two dimension? And you have uh, n times n points. Yes. And now each point interacts with the four neighbors. Mm -hmm. And then it can be either plus or minus. And uh, there is a parameter named temperature, temperature, which tells you how much you like to look like your your neighbors. Now the result is the following: you f you you f you you keep the the points in the boundary, which are just four times n, mm -hmm. fixed. You fix as everybody plus, say, mm -hmm. or everybody minus, mm -hmm. and then you 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 you, you make all the rest of the configuration uses these probabilistic rules. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the influence of the boundary can be entirely determinant to, to say you that the probability of having a plus in, the, in, in, in between, in the middle, mm -hmm. is bigger than one half. So it's not clear. I don't, I don't, I don't understand the mature and Varela comments. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's mainly connecting itself, but the boundary may affect it in a crucial way. Okay. So yeah. it's not clear. So this, uh, yeah. the, the order of magnitude by itself is not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a, an argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's a, that's a yeah. Philosophical part, philosophical yeah. Part of <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. No. No. Because if you take. A visual cortex, mm -hmm. uh, primary visual cortex, mm -hmm. for example, you receive 5% connections from the thalamus and 95% connections from uh, intracortical connections. Mm -hmm. But it is essentially driven by the thalamocortical yeah. input because we want yeah. to see the world and not uh, what mm -hmm. is it, just what is in our heads. Yeah. So I, I just think we, not, we must be careful because yes. we're not talking about connection, a strength of connections. And yeah, this well, I, I only give numbers. It is quite possible that the incoming uh, synapses are stronger than the average intracortical synapse. There is some indication for that. Still, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but the numbers are impressive, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, uh, let me say a few words to cell types, and I simplify here a lot. I hardly dare to in front of Audrey. <laughs> um, but just to make, uh, yeah, we all, yeah. It's for some purposes, it is enough to know that you have two main cell types, 
namely the pyramidal cells and the non-pyramidal cells. The pyramidal cells have these many dendritic spines on their dendrites. They often have uh, a dendritic tree which is, has, a, is, has a basal and an apical dendritic tree which extends into different layers. Um, and they have local and distant axonal ramifications. So the axon ramifies around in the region of the neuron and the axon usually goes down to the white matter and can go wherever, um, but in most cases goes back to the cortex and makes, again, uh, ramifications there. Now, the non-pyramidal cells have smooth dendrites and they have local ramifications, meaning by this that they ramify uh, like this or in other shapes as... Audrey has shown, but they do not go to the white matter and make long-range connections. Uh, to simplify, so much is for some purposes uh, allowed because it correlates with excitation and inhibition. So all pyramidal cells are, make excitatory synapses, only excitatory synapses. They receive both kinds on their dendrites, but they make uh, themselves only excitatory synapses, and these neurons make only inhibitory synapses on their axons. Um, quantifying this, these are data. This is the, uh, data from various labs. Uh, also, Peters came up with it first that pyramidal cells are in the vast majority, about 85%, uh, I think you said 90, it's something... It's a, a large number <laughs> uh, of all neurons are of that type. So most of the neurons are excitatory. Um, so first conclusion, or the second conclusion, the vast majority of neurons is, is well, <laughs> sorry, Audrey. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's an awful simplification, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, is of one main type, let's say, <laughs> namely excitatory. Um, pyramidal cells, now we include among them all the spiny stellate cells, and here, uh, I, I think, did you say they are inhibitory? I, yeah, they are also excitatory, yeah. So, forget, yeah, yeah. It's not any contradiction to what you said. It's just a simplification. <laughs> and um, so, um, okay. Now, um, the question, synapses, the, in the electron microscope, you can distinguish inhibitory and excitatory synapses. This is a type, sorry, Type 1 synapse, uh, excitatory synapse here is a um, cross-section through a spine head, and you see here this thick black postsynaptic thickening, and this is a cross-section through an axon, axonal bouton, and you see the many um, um, uh, transmitter vesicles. And uh, this is uh, characteristic, so the round vesicles and the thick postsynaptic thickening characteristic for excitatory synapses, while inhibitory synapses here is a cross-section through a dendrite and again through a synaptic bouton. They have a much smaller postsynaptic thickening and they have more elongated vesicles. Quantifying this, you find in the cortex... Uh, find that about 90% of the synapses in the cortex are indeed excitatory. Um, say, fitting to this, that you have not only many excitatory neurons, they, on only, they also make really most of the synaptic contacts in the cortex. And uh, another interesting number is this one here. Namely, that 75% of the synapses in the cortex are located on dendritic spines, which means uh, on pyramidal cells. And this, uh, sorry, 
uh, one must come to the conclusion that most of the synapses in the cortex are indeed synapses between pyramidal cells. Both the presynaptic parts are mainly excitatory and both the postsynaptic parts are uh, synapses on pyramidal cells. So, yeah. So you have a big network in itself, a big excitatory network in itself, and um, for that purpose I will not talk anymore about inhibitory ne <laughs> neurons now. It's good that you did it, because I just, um, I don't say that not important, not at all. I mean, they, without them you would have epileptic fits all of the time, and of course also some kind of learning may depend on inhibitory neurons, um, but uh, I will just now stick to the excitatory neurons. Uh, a, few, a few words to the spines. Why are so many uh, synapses on dendritic spines? What is their role? Um, yeah, there is the conviction, I think, by many people and by myself also, <laughs> that the dendritic spines are devices for, are particularly suited devices for learning, for plasticity. Um, and <coughs> one thing which is striking is that different shape. You have very thick spines, you have very thin spines, and uh, there is some evidence that uh, shape of the spine is is a way to make a, a synapse plastic, plastic, to change the strength of the synapse. Of course, here you can place a much bigger synapse than here, and also the electrical things that happen may be uh, better accessible to, to the cell body than, than here. Um, so uh, dendritic spines are probably particularly good devices for learning. Now, uh, one, of, one reason why I think this is that uh, this is from very old work for me when I compared adult animals to newborn, uh, adult guinea pigs to newborn guinea pigs. Guinea pigs are born in a very mature state, as I said already yesterday, I think. And, uh, and so, they come, they are born with most of their spines already. So it is certainly not so that s spines come, I mean it may, it's possible that there come later also some spines uh, producing new synapses, but, but I think it's not the main property. The main, uh, they, the, the main difference between, so these are the adult dendrites from adult animals, these are from newborn animals. And the main difference was that you have many more of these thin, slender spines than in this case. So, uh, conclusion from that, uh, in the cortex are probably most of the synapses are particularly well, uh, well are learning elements. How, do, how, how did you get this conclusion? Uh, <laughs> Well, 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 the first thing one would think if one sees a spine, one would think it's there to grasp an axon somewhere to make a synapse. We have some evidence that in the developing animal, the synapses are there before the spines. So there is a synapse between an axon and a dendrite, and, the, and then a spine is growing out in the place of a snap. Yeah. So, um, my, yeah. On the other hand, there are new studies on cell <laughs> tissue culture where they show that they can, um, they can produce a spine by making LTP. So this evident, this is also, so making new spines may also be a possibility to to learn, if you call LTP learning. So, uh, well, with the activity, something cha changes in the spines. 
either you get a new spine or the shape of the spine may change. i mean the question is why do you have neurons with spines and others without? there is also some pruning of synapses and spines yes that's true depending on enriched environment or so yes that's one point yes mhm Just instead of LTP, you can say strengthening of a synapse to make it stronger. That if you activate the the neuron, you get some EPSP, some activation in the next neuron, and if you do this several times, you get may get a stronger activation. But yeah. But what I meant was a strengthening of synapses. Uh, um, now, what is, now we come to the number you calculated already yesterday. Uh, in the mouse cortex, there are about nine to the times 10 to the fourth neurons per cubic millimeter and about 7.5 times 10 to the eighth synapses per cubic millimeter. So in average, you get about 8,000 synapses per neuron. And the big question is, to how many different neurons? Um, are they all going to different neurons or not? From Audrey, we know already they do not go all to different neurons, but they may make several synapses with one <coughs> neuron. But um, from the graphs I showed before, and also when you look at this picture, uh, you see the density of neurons, the season ramification patterns. It is clear that each, each such uh, axonal tree traverses very, very, very many dendritic trees of other neurons. And um, at least from from the, uh, what I showed before, it, it's certain that each neuron makes, m makes synapses with many, many, many different neurons, with thousands of different neurons. Uh, why did I show that? Ah, this is, an, uh, this is a light microscopic picture. Uh, which gives you an impression of the density of synapses. Uh, it has been made, uh, this is a special um, uh, uh, f um, stain for a synapses with electron microscopy, uh, where you get, where you see really only the synapses. And while well, synapses are very small below the resolution of the light microscope, still you can see if they are like this, you can uh, see them in the, in the dark field, um, like s stars on the, in the heaven. And this is a thin section of about one micrometer or so. And you see the enormous density of synapses. Here you can guess uh, a cell body uh, and, the, and, yeah. Okay. So we come to that conclusion concerning the probability of connections between two pyramidal cells at, o at full overlap. You have a low chance of having no synapse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, with, uh, you have a, high a higher probability of one or two, uh, but with three, it it's becomes already less. Um, yeah.
So from that we conclude that an individual pyramidal cell has thousands of synaptic targets. I, I'm talking now only about pyramidal cells. Uh, so we have an enormous highly high degree of divergence and convergence of signals at each uh, neuron. Which means, again, that most pyramidal cells are weakly connected to each other only via one or a few synapses. I better say a few, <laughs> having Audrey here. <laughs> um, still, um, it is something which, to my knowledge, has also been found in electrophysiology, maybe, um, that the connections... I mean, it's not a very strong signal you get, but you know better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that probably, um, I would say that it's probably one, if you activate only one neuron, you will not be able to activate the next neuron. Would you agree to that, it, that you need always a cooperation? Uh, you need m several neurons must converge onto a pyramidal cell to a activate it to make it spike itself. Uh, now, quantitatively, mean, this means that each neuron is connected with every other cortical neuron via only one or a few synaptic steps. In case of the mouse, uh, let's say, each neuron, each pyramidal cell connects to, let's say, 5,000 different neurons, not 8,000, but 5,000, and each of them, again, to 5,000, you end up at two, in, after two steps in, uh, at 2.5 times 10 to the seventh neurons, I think, which is already more than there are neurons in the cortex of the mouse. When you say few, you mean how many steps? Uh, one, well, one or two, um, well, if you calculate it as I just did, you say each neuron connects to 5,000 others, and these again to 5,000 others, you end up at 2.5 times 10 to the seventh after two steps. And this is already more than you have, than the mouse has neurons in the cortex. Sorry? That's overcounting, right? Uh, I mean, it depends on the yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we did some tracer studies which. Um, showed that it, in reality, it's a bit more. It's about three to four steps in the mouse. And finally, what we also think from this, that uh, the connectivity between individual neurons, I better say pyramidal cells now, <laughs> are largely statistically predetermined. Um, I say predetermined. I mean, that can happen things by learning, Learning will strengthen some and maybe change others, but we, it's impossible to think here of a system similar to that what I said about the fly system where you have uh, each synapse is predetermined. Uh, this is just unthinkable. Um, so I think uh, largely statistical predetermined, would you agree? Or... <laughs> No, well, we can discuss it. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, oh, well, no, well. In the old days, before I started, <laughs> people thought, me too, synapses in the cortex were produced by learning. They make the, the more they learn, yeah. But when I worked on the guinea pig and saw that the guinea pig is born with more or less all of its synapses, I understood that in order to learn, you, you first need a network. You, you, yeah, you need to bring things together to be able to learn, and then you can modify this network by strengthening, mainly by strengthening synapses. Maybe uh, you lose some or so, but um, I think the 
formation of new elements is less a case in adult than just the strengthening of connections. Well, you do not learn, all, I mean, you learn all the time, but you know also a lot of things already and must be able to uh, deal with them, to have associations, to, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is also learning. Which you can have the best Mm-hmm. Or the entire Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you teach it's very bad, then you kill the spine. Well, the thing is, we have to think that the negative is part of the learning. That we're not actually, I mean, LTT is as important as LTT. Mm-hmm. So there is a linguistic ex- experiment with phonology. So I don't remember the details, but it, it seems that um, experimental evidence tells you that uh, a small kid, a few months kid, has all the possibilities of opposition between phonemes. And then as, as time goes on and he learns one language, he makes class of equivalence and then he becomes unable to see differences. So it looks like that you have all the connection and then you, you, you make some selection. It seems. Okay. Prune, pruning, taking away connections which are un- useless. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, what is such a network suited for? Uh, that is what we think here, that this network is mainly a mixing machine bringing together a lot of information at each point. That it's also that it's mainly a memory device uh, full of synapses which are, can be changed, uh, which are changeable, and that the whole thing then is, can be best described as an associative memory uh, with the formation of cell assemblies in the Hebian sense. I will tell in a moment. Okay, uh, so I say here again, mixing machine, learning learning by association, uh, meaning this by this, that it's a device which can bring together correlated activity in the outside world by forming cell assemblies. Okay, what is a cell assembly? <laughs> That's a uh, what Hebb um, suggested in 1949, that learning is done by strengthening of connections. When it, whenever uh, pyramidal cells are activated together, that the connection between them is strengthened. So if 
a child goes into the garden and sees a rose, it sees red and green and it sticks, it it's, uh, can hurt it itself and the mother says rose. So these properties appear often together. And uh, the, synap the neurons involved in this activity will have will strengthen the synapses. So, and when this has happened often enough, it is enough that the mother says rose and the whole network will be switched on and you think of a rose. <laughs> Certain nodes are connected. It doesn't matter which neural is working for this, but I can see some structure there. Is this structure somehow connected to a function? Of a, <laughs> so if you see this structure in different part of the brain or somewhere else, you can say that this is related to some activities. Uh, I mean, you cannot see it with your own eyes, but I mean, this, this is the visual cortex, so you see, when you see the rose, neurons will be activated there. This is the somatosensory cortex. You, get, you will hurt yourself when you touch the rose. Here is the language cortex. Uh, so in each case, there will be neurons being activated here and here and here. And um, they will, at a certain point, understand that they belong together. So and in another way, I'm trying to understand. Yeah. If somebody shows you this without telling you... Ah, that it, no, okay, you don't can, know. <laughs> we don't know. No, you don't know. You would need to have an, an electrophysiologist. You would have to need Audrey to put electrodes here and here and here and see um, if you find neurons which are active together when you see something. Yes. And, but it, it's, uh, So it's very difficult to prove that because... Yeah, the um, the idea of structure patterning is of course very important, but it doesn't mean that that concerns being activated or not. You can be activated, and. Um, be part of an assembly and be activated and be a part of another assembly. So okay. activation is not, you understand. And of course, this is um, all <laughs> conceptual, all concepts. Concepts trying uh, to link the two things, function and, uh, uh, and, the, and the patternings in, in the brain. But not necessarily you need to be activated or not activated. The neuron can be activated all the time, and this happens. It's not that the brain gets activated. That's the point. Uh, uh, the point uh, that's been trying to, to put uh, all these days is, so I, I, it's not important which neurons, but uh, a certain structure to be defined, maybe, maybe uh, 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 a figure like this, Maybe a type of graph, say, if you see a football game, then your brain behaves, I will say, a stupid thing, like an Erdogan-Heni uh, graph, uh, super critical. But if it is uh, rugby, then it's an erdogan under uh, super critical. I'm saying stupid things, but it's a structure, it's a more abstract level. And, well, in, in a very humble way, Something was obtained with EEG data, uh, with experiment cloud and um, other performed. We'll discuss it in, in lunch, but I guess that's the most important question. It's not which neurons are there, but if you can find a kind of a global qualitative property, and what Gallen did, uh, if I remember correctly, was he was able to recover uh, uh, scenes of a movie, from the activation. So he did the statistical model selection to say when Superman is flying, the distribution I saw in the cortex was this distribution. And then finding these distributions, he was able to identify for other movies. Yeah. So I don't know about this network too much, but for example, protein-protein interaction networks, we know 
the set of structure actually means something. They, they, they are related to some, even diseases. So that's what is going on. I, I, I'm trying to see whether something like this could be concluded here, because then we have a lot of work to do, good work. I, 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 I'm, I'm a bit lost now. <laughs> uh, may I just yeah, continue, continue as I think it works? <laughs> so according to Hebb, it is really a, a particular pattern of neurons, uh, it, it is, uh, so these neurons, however, they, these neurons found together, they, they represent some term, a rose or whatever, um, but these can overlap with other neurons, which ha with other terms which have similar properties. If you have a tulip, a tulip has many things in common with a rose, so we'll, you will have neurons which are active in both cell assemblies, um, and uh, so the idea is that while in the term of thinking or making associations, you may jump from one cell assembly to another. Um, yeah, I don't know how it fits to what you just said, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> level, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, too small for probably we do mm -hmm. some work because it's 100 nodes. Mm -hmm. What we need is, a, 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 say, the graphic structure of the brain at the new, neuronal level. Mm -hmm. This so morning at breakfast, have, sorry? We do have it at low sample. Low sample, well, yeah, yeah. Level. Well, but still, I mean, people that, uh, well, when I give my talk, I talk about the, the model by Porchens and Dismond. They made this connectivity map, but they don't analyze it using graph theoretical uh, and measures. So what's missing is that. To this morning I was talking to Renko. The only model I know which has done that is the a model of the Dente gyrus. Uh, today, uh, Otto has mentioned it. Uh, they, they got this guy, Ivan Soltes from UC Irvine. They constructed a one-to-one -one, uh, network model of the structure of, of the Dente gyrus uh, connectivity. It's one million nodes. One million nodes. And they analyze it uh, uh, for different uh, levels of sclerosis using graph theoretical measures like uh, the path length and, and clustering coefficient. And they were able to show that the, say, the small wordiness of the network increased as you increase the sclerosis level. So in that case, they have this. They have a graph and a very large one. They could use the, the measures that uh, the statisticians and, and, and mathematicians do to analyze. But we don't have that yet for the cortex. We're, we're getting there probably via workshops like this, but we, we don't have that yet. So what we can say at the moment is things for these macroscopic networks that people are uncovering via fMRI, but still the structure is too small for us to get some, say, definitive conclusion. That's okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so I will pr just briefly, when Hebb made this, his theory, he could not know all these details, but what... What, he, um, what is required for this theory is that you have many neurons of the same kind, that they are connected with each other via excitatory connections, via modifiable connections, not only local connections, and that each neuron should be connected to many others in order to make many kinds of associations. And this is exactly what I just showed you find in the cortex. So um, what I want to say that the anatomical data are in strongly in favor of that theory. And not only, ah, no, I should also say, you, yeah, one could say, so what? Maybe the whole brain is like that. So is, is that anything special, these properties here? And the answer says, is yes, of course, it is something special. If you compare the cerebral cortex, the, the basic connectivity of the cerebral cortex with, these, with other parts of the brain, um, so again here, the cortex is mainly connected in itself via exci mainly excitatory connections. In the basal ganglia, you also have a network connected in itself, but it is mainly in, it is inhibitory connections. In the thalamus, you have also mainly excitatory neurons, as you have in the cortex, but they do not make direct connections with each other. They only project to the cortex or they project to inhibitory neurons. 
And finally, in the cerebellar cortex, which, as I said yesterday, has even many more cells as the cerebral cortex does, many more excitatory cells, but all these avoid, they do not make a single synapse among each other. They only project to inhibitory neurons. So it is really something special to have uh, such an uh, excitatory um, system. Um, and... Uh, Yeah, so, so obviously the basic function of the cortex is dealing with correlations to detect. What we've been talking about today is for the cerebral cortex? Yes, yeah. Okay. Other parts of the brain are different. No, I did not, yeah, only, yeah, they are, as I just said here, they have a quite, uh, a basically very different kind of network structure. So, um, the basic, what the cortex is good for, is to deal with correlations, namely to detect, to incorporate, and to handle correlations in the outside world, and, yeah. and uh, which is what you need for learning, for making associations, for thinking. And uh, it also fits very nicely to this theory here, The Sinfire Chain Theory by Moshe Abeles. Are you familiar with that? <laughs> uh, namely, in contrast to the Hebbian Theory, uh, Hebbian Theory says how things are, are, are um, in locate or how it, they are, how terms are um, in the brain, and he, he thinks more about the sequences of activity, about the dynamic aspects. And also he says uh, the, the, connectiv the, the connectivity between individual neurons is weak, so you always need a, you need a group of neurons uh, to work together. You need cooperation. So from these neurons, which project to many, many, many other neurons, there must be neurons within, this, within their postsynaptic neurons which get input from all input from this group and among them there must be again enough neurons to pro project on the same neurons and so on. It's the only way to get activity through in the cortex. So the cell assemblies are considered as the result of incident correlations while the sunfire chains a result of time-shifted correlations. Okay, I think I skipped this, or maybe I just was, yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's too complicated. Uh, I wanted to come back to the term of statistical connectivity. Um, um, and here, you know, there are deviations from the expected probability and that is what Audrey talked about this morning and there are deviations <laughs> um, but for statistical connectivity you, I mean what you need is the number the num number of cell types and subtypes you must know the patterns of ramification uh, there is a paper which deals a lot with that and, and looking uh, already with looking only at the patterns of magnetic Uh, ramifications, you can be, get very specific connectivities with respect to layers, for example. Um, uh, deviations from the expected probability as yes, learning can play a role, uh, but, and, but indeed there are cells, as we have heard from Rod Audrey, who really, for example, the chandelier cells, they do not make any synapses with any with uh, They only make synapses with pyramidal cells, not with non-pyramidal cells. And, yeah, I just wanted to refer to these papers, which deal in more detail with the uh, question to what extent statistical, to what extent uh, deviations from that. But um, we heard a lot about this already from Audrey. So, I, yeah, so that's all what I want to say today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I will start.
Maybe so. So I, I would like to extend a little bit the concepts of um, assemblies. You mentioned the sin fire chain. Yes. But of course, it's very important to consider inhibition um, produces um, mm -hmm. oscillations. And that these are similar, related, but different concepts. Because um, sin fire chains in um, neuronal oscillations are related in, in the sense that they um, put a lot of emphasis on, on the precise timing of, of the yeah. spiking activity. Yeah. <clears throat> However, you see with oscillations, you can create relationships that, of course, is at the core of understanding the problem of thinking, cognition, perception. Why? Because uh, it's clear for everybody that the brain is, is, a, is a machine that creates internal relationships, as many times you mentioned, mm -hmm. but it's a completely different mechanism. And um, perhaps you want to comment on this and uh, only to add um, to what you said that we have here a completely different framework of thinking that inhibition is very important in, um, how you say, uh, um, scavando, how you say this? Um, digging. Not digging, the, um, like a sculpture, sculpting yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and creating a mm -hmm. timing framework where these mm -hmm. relationships are then possible. Yeah. And it, this is um, related but different from um, the concept of seeing fire chain. Thank you. It's not a question, it's a comment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, learning that inhibition, for example, children learn first or they think first that all old men are, are grandfathers uh, they tend to say Opa in German <laughs> to old men <laughs> and after a while they understand that not all old men are grandfathers they are grandfather so I think there some inhibition must play a role, a differentiation must, ha must happen uh, a child learns something globally and then it, it knows, ah, not, uh, these features may not, if this feature is not there, then it's not this person. Um, so this is something which is not uh, taken, this is not uh, in the Hebbian theory, so this does not say all, I mean, Inhibition may play a role in that kind of learning, certainly. Uh, but I'm not sure if I, if my comment fits to your, <laughs> to yours. <laughs> yes. Observation. Uh, the, the, most the most concrete example, mathematical example, etc., of cell assemblies, is the Hopfield model. Hopfield class model. In the Hopfield model, uh, there is uh, not only excitatory synapse. It is very important to have inhibitory synapse. So inhibition is, pre is present in, in Hopfield models, and it is an example of cell assemblies, Hebbian cell assemblies. Thank What's the hope? Uh, uh, basically, uh, oh, yes, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, a large network of, uh, um, of neurons with the uh, connection matrix uh, with, uh, which follows the Hebbian learning whole. If it, uh, yes, For, yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, okay. If if if, if, if the, the Last there is comment. correlation, the, the synapse grow. If it, there is no correlation, the synapse is. is uh, if I'm not decreased. mistaken, for the Hopfield model, you can be uh, a given neuron can be excitatory with a given partner, and inhibitory with, with another one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, for the Hopfield model. A given neuron can have an excitatory synapse with another neuron. You hop the model. And 
at the same time an inhibitory synapse with another one. In the basic HOP model, yes, but uh, there are variations on the, and we, so can, we can fix this problem. You can fix it? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's thank again. And